In this video, I'll be showing you five of my most important tips when it comes to mixed signal PCB and mixed signal hardware design. Mixed signal meaning we have significant digital and significantly sized analog sections in our design, and we of course need to take care when we're designing and laying out this system. The board you're seeing here is a four layer mix signal system and in particular it's a DSP system for the electric guitar so I can program this to write different guitar effects such as reverb, overdrives and so forth and we'll be examining this design in this video. So let's get started. Thank you very much to Altium for sponsoring this video. The PCB you're seeing in this video was completely designed in Altium Designer and if you'd like to give Altium Designer a try for yourself please follow the link in the description or go to altium.com forward slash yt forward slash Phil's lab to get yourself a free trial of Altium Designer. I've also collaborated with Altium for their next design review competition showcasing some features of Altium 365 such as the online viewer and design review capabilities. I've added some mistakes into the PCB design you're seeing in this video and it's up to you if you'd like of course to find these PCB mistakes both in the schematic and the PCB and you can enter to win a $200 gift card. I'll leave a link to this in the description below. Thank you also very much to PCBWay for sponsoring this video. I had these PCBs manufactured and assembled using their PCB prototype service. I needed a specific PCB thickness with immersion gold and I made 10 pieces of these. So just for the PCBs alone, it's about $12 a piece, which is incredibly cost effective given the immersion gold, given the number of layers and so on. I also had these PCBs assembled with STM32H7 processors, codecs and so on. So quite a lot of components. So including components, that's about another $500 on top for 10 pieces, which I also think is very reasonable. The item you're seeing at the bottom here are control PCBs, that, which then plug in via ribbon cable to these PCBs. And those for, for two layers, just about $20. So all in all, for this order, 10 fully assembled PCBs, four layers with custom, including components costs, about $68 for prototype PCBs, which I think is very, very reasonable. So I'd highly suggest you check them out and we'll see more of PCBWay in future videos as well. Here we are now in Altium Designer, the PCB we saw at the start of this video. Let me just briefly guide you through so we get an overview and then we'll look into the five tips that help you improve your performance of your mixed signal PCB designs. Mixed signal, just to clarify for me, is when a PCB or bit of hardware contains quite a substantial analog section as well as quite a substantial digital section. In this case, this is a digital guitar effects processing system. So we have a DSP processor. In this case, it's this fairly powerful STM32 H7 microcontroller in the center with various digital peripherals such as QSPI flash memory, USB with the USB-C connector, various interfaces and so on. But we also have quite a substantial analog section because we have to deal with getting the guitar signal in and sending the processed guitar signal out. To do so, I have this analog to digital converter and digital to analog converter chip, which is also known as a codec, as well as some analog front ends and rear ends, so to speak, providing buffering and filtering before we feed in and out of this codec IC. From the PCB design, you can also tell which sections might be digital and which might be analog. Do let me know in the comments if you'd like me to go into more detail into the design of this PCB in a future video. I'd also suggest watching my video number 78 on this channel, which goes over a very similar mixed signal hardware design walkthrough for a six layer, rather small board, and the principles are very similar. In any case, let's start with a first tip. And my first tip in general for 99% of mixed signal designs is do not split your ground. And this starts in the schematic. As you can see here, for example, on this power supply section, I have a digital and analog supply, and we'll talk more about that in a bit. But you can see my ground connections and ground flags are identical. This is the first indication that I have not split grounds and in general I do not think it's a good idea unless you know what you're doing or we have incredibly sensitive systems and you plan these systems very very carefully. In most cases we do not need to split ground. Into the PCB design, I can highlight individual layers in Altium Designer, clicking Control S. This is a four layer board, so my top layer is signal, my bottom layer is signal, but my inner layers are both solid ground fills. And there's a reason for that. What we can see in the ground planes, however, is that we have no cuts other than these small gaps here. If we remind ourselves that the digital section is this upper two thirds of this PCB and the analog section is predominantly the lower third, we can see that the ground plane underneath is not split in any way. Also the second ground plane and the second internal layer isn't either. This is what I'd highly recommend for most designs anyway. Going into 2D view, now I'm on the top layer and I have my ground plane, which is this orange yellowish color underneath. We can see that all traces have a solid reference or solid return plane directly underneath. I'm not crossing any splits, I'm not crossing any voids, and I'm staying clear 
from any voids that are created, for example, by through-hole components or vias. Another tip to avoid field spreading, which is what happens when you cross splits in the return plane on a signal layer, for example. So solid ground plane, no cuts, try to keep your traces away from any voids in the ground plane is tip number one. Extending that tip and carrying it on a tiny bit, I also recommend your spacing between, for example, a signal layer and a ground layer to be as small as can be and as small as reasonably manufacturable without a particular cost adder. This is also the reason why I prefer this four layer stack up being signal, ground, ground, signal. Adjacent to any signal layer, I have a tightly coupled reference plane. For example, in this case, it's 0.11 millimeters. You can also get thinner dielectrics, and that gives me a great coupling between layer one and layer two, and great coupling between layer four and layer three. Again, of helping to avoid field spread, which is particularly important in mixed signal systems, because we don't want any of the electromagnetic fields from the digital side interfering with the analog side. This is especially important as we get closer to this boundary area indicated by this horizontal line here. And we'll go more into that when we look at placement in the next tip. So to summarize, solid ground plane, try to cut it unless you have very specific reasons. Don't root over ground splits and try to keep thin dielectrics between signal and ground layers. Also signal and power layers if you have higher layer count board. My second and also very important tip, equally as important as the first one with grounding, is separation and proper placement, both on a 2D plane, but also this can be on a 3D plane as well. What I mean by this is that my digital section is clearly defined and is far enough away, very roughly speaking, from my analog section. The way I've done that here is laid out all of my digital section in the top two thirds, given myself enough space for this codec, and as far away as I can from the power supplies from the digital section is my analog section. The way I usually do that by IC is that kind of define my placement. For example, looking at this codec I see in the center, if we look at the pinout, and we'll look at more of this in a later tip, we can see that the top row of pins here are digital. We have I squared C, we have I squared S for my audio stream. And on the other side of this I see, we have all of the analog pins and all the analog connections. And this to me indicates very quickly, and this is a very nice pinout of this particular IC, also a reason I chose it, is the placement, is this enables an easier placement of this I see. Essentially, this IC is separated then in the center line, top is digital, bottom is analog. And this gives me my nice split, my theoretical split between digital on the top and analog at the bottom. To extend that thought, I then drew myself on the top overlay or top source screen layer. For me as a visualization, also when it comes to routing, this tells me top is digital, bottom is analog, stay away if I can. And we'll come to this later, but you can also see that I'm crossing this boundary or these domains, so to speak, and I'll show you how I did that and why I did that later. But in this case, this analog IC determined my placement of a digital and analog. So to reiterate tip number two, once you've sorted out your analog and digital domains, try and use spacing to separate these areas, digital and analog into their own distinct sections, trying to maximize the space between them. Not only can you do this in 2D, but you can also do this in 3D if you do double-sided assembly and if space allows, of course. We can see this on this other PCB I did, the six layer PCB, which is rather small and a bit space constrained. I have a lot of my digital section on the top side, but when it comes to 3D separation, which is what I had to do, I placed a lot of my analog section or the predominant parts of my analog section on the bottom side, far away from digital as I can, given the space constraints of this board. And this really is an important tip. It's all about the space separation, trying to maximize the distance between analog and digital domains. Adding onto that tip, what I like to do once I've defined my digital and analog sections, not just with a silkscreen line and a more functional line, so to speak, is doing via fencing or via stitching. So appropriately spaced vias, so to speak, shielding, fencing off my analog and digital sections. So I've done a via array going underneath the codec, separating analog and digital, so to speak. And this is something I'd highly recommend you doing as well. The spacing depends on your maximum frequency of interest and thus the wavelength in the dielectric material. So typically I'd space these vias at a maximum of a tenth of the wavelength of the maximum frequency of interest in the dielectric. Tip number three is what to do when we're crossing domains. In certain cases, and quite often, we'll have to take some digital signals, these might be control signals, from the digital side to the analog side or the analog domain. So crossing domains, let's call it. For example, in this project, I had a microcontroller which could enable this guitar effects processor, essentially using true bypass, and that needs to send a GPIO signal or several to the analog side, indicated by this connection on the schematic. 
this isn't ideal. We're sending a digital signal, even though it might just be a GPIO, from digital to the analog side. How do we get around that? The way I suggest getting around that, depending on the directionality of the signal, the maximum capacitance is allowed and so forth, is by using a Pi filter. So we have a capacitor on one side, series resistor, and a capacitor on the other side. This could also be done with a ferrite bead instead, and there's also integrated filters it's for exactly this case, which integrate a capacitor, series element, and another capacitor, and exactly for crossing these domains and these boundaries. The reason we're doing that is by filtering out any noise that might interfere with the analog circuitry by a coupling by essentially a low-pass filter. The combination of R400 and C401 in one direction and the combination of R400 and C400 in the other direction. So this is a bi-directional filter. We can work out the cutoff frequency, essentially the minus 3 dB point or the half power bandwidth by taking 1 over 2 pi R times C. And typically for GPIO, I'd probably do quite heavy filtering as I have done in this case. You have to be aware though that any system can drive these fairly large capacitances. And for GPIOs, sometimes you might want to put an extra series resistance in the way as well. Another reason for doing that, other than reducing noise, is also to reduce the edge rates. So microcontrollers and digital logic these days can have quite fast, rather short, rise and fall times, and we can reduce the edge rates by adding capacitance to the line, as well as adding a series resistor, again, low pass function. On the PCB, you can see these elements when we're crossing this silkscreen line. And that's why I also like putting silkscreen down on my mixed signal PCBs, as well as this via fencing, because it gives me a clear indication when I'm crossing boundaries and where I need to place these components. So on the digital side, I will place a capacitor feeding into my series element for a B resistor. And on the other side, capacitor and straight to the reference plane below with a short wide via connection. This is then how I would do my boundary crossing for fairly low speed signals such as GPIOs. And this ensures we get minimal coupling between the digital energy into the analog side when we do have to cross these domains. The fourth tip is that of separate supplies. Now, while you could run everything of one supply, for example, just a buck converter or a fairly beefy LDO in this case, it certainly pays off to split your supplies when you're powering digital and analog sections separately. The digital sections typically require higher current than an analog section, at least for this audio design in this case. So I've spec'd my digital LDO in this case at about one amp at 3.3 volts. I've used an LDO instead of a switching regulator, which of course would also be appropriate in this case, just to make sure I have had absolute minimum of noise on the lines. For the analog section, I then used a separate LDO regulator, which gives me a five volt supply at a lower current, about 300 milliamps max. I always suggest oversizing your regulators by a safety margin as well. So the first thing is then the appropriate choice, buck converter versus LDO. Typically LDO will give lower noise, even though buck converters, if you choose the frequency ranges right and the performance right, specific ICs, of course you can use them as well. And you have to if you step down from a large voltage to a lower voltage as well. You could of course cascade from an input voltage to a buck converter, which then feeds an LDO, which feeds the analog section. That's of course fine as well. In this case, my input voltage at about 9 volts was reasonable enough to step down to 5 volts and 3.3 volts using LDOs. Efficiency wasn't important in this case. It's all about noise performance in this particular board. Another way you can aid the power supply is by doing appropriate filtering. We also saw the Pi filters in the previous example, but we can also use them power supplies. So again, Pi filters, capacitor, series element, capacitor. This could be inductor, ferrite bead, resistor, depending. This first Pi filter I like to place very close to the input connector is both for EMC performance and for filtering performance. Then this filtered voltage is passed into my digital section without further filtering that gives me my 3.3 volt supply. However, I do perform some additional filtering going from my VCC supply up to my 9 volt input voltage and the Pi filter by another series element into a fairly large bank of capacitors. Again, this is a low pass filter and aids in isolation between which could be a fairly noisy supply rail at the top here and my supply rail that feeds then my analog system. Of course, you have to watch out for power and current consumption and size the series elements appropriately, as well as sizing the capacitors properly so you have a low enough cutoff frequency to filter out noise of interest. I would certainly recommend separating your digital and analog supplies, as well as performing additional filtering by Pi or low pass filters, appropriately sized, of course. On the PCB, we can see that, for example, the input power source, this DC jack feeding via reverse polarity protection into my first Pi filter. Down, this regulator here is my 3.3 volt LDO regulator, again, nicely on the digital side. Then I'm feeding into this RC low pass filter and staying away from the rest of these digital components, feeding my analog power supply trace as far as I can, then over into my analog side, my analog regulator generating my five volts 
Then again, using a pie filter crossing into my analog domain. So there's quite a lot of filtering going on here, but I wanted to make absolutely sure I'm getting no problems with power supply noise. This then feeds my analog section. So again, also with analog and digital supplies, it's all about separation as well as filtering and appropriate component choices. The final point or tip I'd like to give in this video is regarding proper selection of ICs and components. And this is incredibly important for mixed signal design. We might just be inclined to choose just a random regulator, a random LDO, or random codec, which you know has enough bits, which has a good enough sampling rate. But there's many different aspects to choosing ICs and components that we need to take care of. I'd like to just highlight a couple of examples now. For example, when looking at low dropout regulators, let's say for the analog supply, we certainly have different parameters that we need to look out for. Looking at the data sheet, for example, for this NCP718, things we need to look out for other than, of course, the input output voltage ranges, currents, and so on, are noise levels. For example, this one is typically specced between a certain band, for example, 100 hertz to 100 kilohertz to 36 microvolts RMS, and this is pretty decent for a regulator like so. We also need to think about power supply rejection ratios and so on. If we contrast this with a different regulator, for example, this gives us 40 microvolts, so this already might be slightly worse. However, it might have a better power supply rejection ratio and so on. So there's always going to be a trade-off also when it, when it comes to cost. For example, some regulators like so might include an additional bypass pin, which needs to be hooked up to an additional capacitor to actually inherently reduce the LDO's output noise. Whereas, for example, the NCP718 does not need this and might have a typically lower noise anyway. So there's trade-offs, first of all, from the power supply part. Let's also talk about codecs as another example. A very popular codec and one you can find quite a lot is this TLV320 by Texas Instruments. If we look at the datasheet, however, and look at the pin assignments, we can see from a layout point of view, this might complicate our live a tiny bit. Remember that we want to separate into analog and digital sections, giving us enough space and giving us a clear cut line between those sections. However, looking at this TLV320 codec, which other than its pinout seems fairly reasonable, sampling rates, bit depths, and so on. But looking at the pinout, we have digital on the left creeping, for example, pin nine is SDA into the analog side. We have some analog pins at the top next to digital pins. There's no clear separation between analog and digital. So this is why maybe I would dismiss this chip because it functionality wise is okay, but layout wise, it just complicates things. If you compare that to the codec I see I actually went with in the end and looking at its pinout, not only is this package easier to handle, easier to solder and assemble, it also has a far nicer pinout and nicer separation. On the left hand side, we have pretty much all digital signals on the right hand side, pretty much all analog. Another reason I went for this, but of course you have to take everything into account, not just the pinout. You need to decide if this is suitable for your specific application. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope the tips were useful and you can apply them in your next mix signal PCB and hardware design. If you liked the video, please do leave a like and a comment if you have any questions. Otherwise, if you don't want to miss any future PCB hardware design and DSP videos, make sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. If you're interested in more mixed signal design content, I do have a course on mixed signal hardware design using KeyCard 6. And if you're interested, please follow the link in the description below. Thanks again for watching and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye-bye.